This morning I woke up to about 50 emails from golfers asking if I saw Matt Wolf win the 3M Open this week. And they were asking questions about his swing because he has quite a unique movement or unique characteristics at least to the movement. But there's also a lot of good elements in his swings that all pros have. And so in this analysis, we're going to have a look at what is unique and what makes his swing function so well. And I'm going to show you some of the unique characteristics and that actually increase function or improve performance. I think many amateurs can learn a lot from motions like this that don't fit inside the norms of what's taught. I'll also give you some valuable lessons at the end of this analysis that you can take away to improve your own philosophy. Now as a golf coach, I'm known for talking about function over form, but I also want to clarify that that doesn't mean that form doesn't matter. It's just that good form can arise from working on function. So working on things like impact or even the performance, how many fairways you hit, things like that, can actually in itself improve motion or improve form. It's also important to note that good form might not always look like you imagine. So it's not always going to be symmetrical, as you can see here with Matt Wolf's backswing and downswing being wildly different. Now, Matt isn't my student. He is a student with a guy called George Gankers, who's a very well-known, high, highly reputable instructor. Um, and utmost props to him for working with the uniqueness of this swing and not tearing it apart. There are a lot of great teachers out there. Do your own research on who to work with. But let's be honest, many teachers would have torn this swing apart. So respect the GG for working with this motion and harnessing it without destroying it. So to start, one of the unique things with Matt is how he sets up. So you can see that his feet are pointing in a, a certain direction. And I've often seen Matt aim to the right with his lower body with his feet. But you can see the hips and shoulders are actually open at address. So that goes to dispelling the myth that you need everything in perfect alignment. Now I don't like to see positions way off or alignments of different body segments way off at the start. But again, I like to see swings like this because it challenges my own beliefs on this topic. We can also note here, this is a face on of Matt and you can see the grip is actually quite weak. And how I, how I look at that or visualize that is drawing a line down the club shaft. I look at the wrist joint. So if I put a red dot on his glove there, normally for most pros, that is the other side of that line, the right side or the left side as we view it. So that's what I call a weaker grip position. And in fact, this camera angle is slightly off. And you can see lots of people would say, oh, that ball position is really far back. But the camera angle is just a little bit off. He's also on a slight downslope there. If you were to turn the camera or move the camera, shift it to the left a little bit, that grip would look even weaker. Now, probably the most unique part of Matt Wolf's swing is when he starts to take it back, he takes it way outside the line, which is actually something that I do. It's not something I teach, it's just, it's not to me a hugely relevant thing. Um, and most people, by the time he gets to this point in the swing, I mean, that club shaft is on the same line as his posture, or a very similar line to his posture, which if we were to compare to a more orthodox looking swing of Justin Thomas here, you can see that it's almost 90 degrees difference between the club shaft positions. Body positions are quite similar. Maybe the right arm is in a, a much different position, which we'll have a look at in a moment. And they kind of relate the shaft angle and the right arm position do relate there. And there are many players who have taken it back similarly. Calvin Pete, one of the straightest guys ever to have lived, was quite similar in the top of the back or the halfway back position there. You can see a very steep club shaft. And Jim Furyk is probably one of the most notable other examples of this. Again, it's nowhere near to the extreme that Matt is there, but they're on similar lines. I would like to note that just to compare the difference here. There are great players who have done the opposite. So this is Ray Floyd and you can see, I mean, look how inside that club shaft is there or the club head compared to Matt Wolf at this position. They're, they're pretty much opposite ends of the spectrum there. And that would change how the shaft looks a little later on in the swing. 
And Nancy Lopez, another amazing golfer, uh, also exhibits the opposite end of the spectrum. In fact, her club head is, by that point, is actually off the screen there. Um, so there are a wide range of positions that could be functional in golf. And Matt's is just one of them. Nancy's is, a, is a, another that is very, very functional. So this position from Matt, as he takes it back very steep there with the club shaft, that'll tend to, not always, but in, in this case it's true, get that club very across the line. I'd say in most cases that would be uh, what happens at this point in the swing. So what I mean by across the line is that club is pointing way to the right as opposed to a more orthodox look where the club points down parallel to the target. You can also see this left foot, the lead foot there, if I do it in yellow so it's a little clearer. Uh, the lead foot has been picked up off the ground and I think that many golfers will instinctively do this when they first start and then they get taught to keep the foot on the ground. And there are certain situations where I can see keeping the foot on the ground as being valuable. I do it myself. But that's only because I was taught that. And I think it's been something that's been perpetuated in the golf industry for a long time. And I think Brandel Chambly wrote a good book on, on this topic, or, or this was one of the elements that he discussed about how if you go back to say the 50s, 40s, 60s even, most golfers actually picked the foot up off the ground. So it's not a bad move. Lots of golfers see it as, oh, that's different right now. But that's only because they're looking at all the modern players who've been taught to keep that foot on the ground. There are actually certain advantages to taking that foot up off the ground. And for older golfers, it can help you with increasing hip turn. Um, it can also increase ground pressure when we go to transition later, which can improve power. If I take Matt on a few more frames, it's easier to see here the club face, and the club face is toe down, which most would consider a very open position. I, I would also look at that lead wrist, and they're, they're on similar lines, but not exactly. And so the open position of the club face at the top is a combination of that weaker grip and also a quite steep left arm at the top there. Oh, it's, it's not bad now. It's, it's actually much more, much flatter than it was earlier in that uh, pre-transition. But if we compare this position from Matt with the club face, so that's Matt Wolf's club face at the top there. Look at Dustin Johnson on the left. It's hard to see it with that background, but it's, I think it's gone beyond horizontal there. So it's a very, very different look, more than 90 degrees different at the top there. And you can see part of that is gonna be down to the wrist positions at the top. Matt has, Matt has more cup or more flexion to that lead wrist. And Dustin Johnson has a little bit more bow or extension to that lead wrist. But also a lot of that has to do with the grip or the starting positions with the hands. So again, here's two opposite ends of the spectrum to see that there are many functional variants of swing on tour. And although Matt's swing is quite different to Dustin Johnson's, there are several players throughout history who have swung in a very similar fashion to Matt Wolf. So again, if we go to the Calvin Pete swing, in fact, I have another one here. If I get him to the top, you can see if I pause there, they look very, very similar. And another great professional, Miller Barber, this is an older video of him. And again, very similar look. We don't actually get to see the, the club face there or the club head, but you see the left foot is up off the ground. And if I just go back another few frames on Matt, look at the right arm position, that's very similar. And that right arm position or the flying right elbow is a trait that Jack Nicholas had as well. And it tends to get that club a little bit more across the line at the top or pointing to the right. And here's a really old video of a guy called Gay Brewer. And he swings incredibly similar to, to Matt at the top. The takeaway is very different. So again, there's even more routes to get into this top of the swing position. But that top of the swing position, at least with the club pointing in that direction, the club face being a little bit more open, is very similar. And the lower body is very similar to Matt there. Now the beauty of mat swing is in the transition. So there are a few things of note here. Number one, if I draw a line on the top of Matt's head here, what you see is in transition, you see quite a notable squat. So he's dropped in height. That's more than a golf ball in height. That's, that's quite a few inches, seven, maybe eight inches or so in height. And many players have this. Tiger exhibits it. In fact, a 
I would say over 90% of the tour exhibit that squatting action in transition. And if we view this action from the, the face on view here, again, you can see big squat into the, into the left side, probably not as noticeable as the down the line view, but this will vary in different amounts. And if I draw in red, a line up against the, the lead hips there or the lead hip, he also shifts forward, not probably not as much as most on tour. And I know this is something that uh, the guys work on and it matches up really well with mat swing, um, but the hips do move forwards. And so that lowering of the body and shift forwards is a result of trying to create pressure in that lead side. So if you had a weighing scale under this left foot and I asked, a golfer or anybody to try and make that needle jump so it's one of the old analog scales what they would do is they would press into that and that pressing would result in shifting forwards a little bit and dropping down so when we're doing these movements it's important to understand the kinetics or the forces involved as well we're not just trying to move our body forwards and down we're actually doing it for a reason and the reason is we're trying to create pressure into the ground or trying to make that needle jump in the in the downswing or during the transition now for lots of you who suffer with early extension this is actually a really good move and this is one that early extenders don't tend to have is the squat down and forwards in transition. If you watch the right arm of Matt, it goes from what we call internal rotation to external rotation. That right elbow gets pulled down in this direction here. And so that is a great shallowing move for the club. And you can see how the shaft there goes from that steep across the line to a much shallower laid off look. And by this position in the swing, Matt looks like most other guys on tour. Now that's a very similar move to how baseball players work or the, the action of a baseball swing. So you can see that that uh, baseball bat is very steep at that position. And look at the right arm. Look how high the elbow is. And then as the player starts to force, as, as the baseball starts to force the bat, you see how that elbow drops down closer to the body and starts driving forward so that lead that rear elbow is actually leading the shoulder at this point and that shallows that bat so the bat gets from a very steep position to shallow and that's the same thing that matt is using Now this is where it might get a little bit complicated, so you can tune out for this one or try and absorb as much of it as possible. And I'll use some analogies to make sure it's a little bit better understood. So from the top of the swing, Matt is gonna force his hands a little bit down. So they're gonna move down, but they're also gonna move out to a certain extent. Now I don't have access to force and torque graphs or anything like that, but I would hypothesize that it's gonna be somewhere in this direction here. So Matt's gonna be forcing in this direction. And what happens is just like a water skier, if the boat forces in this direction, so the boat is moving forwards and creating a force, the water skier is actually gonna accelerate this way towards the towards the waves being created by the boat. So if I draw on in red, we call this the line of action. And some great biomechanists like Sasha McKenzie have explained this to me, uh, but it is kind of basic physics. I wasn't great at physics, but this is how I understand it. So that line of action, that red line there, the water ski is going to want to accelerate to and probably through that line. So it's going to end up going the other side of those waves. Now, if you can visualize Matt's hands as being the boat, we're going to have a line of action or waves that go this way. And so the water skier or the club head, I told you this is complicated, the water skier uh, or the club head is going to want to accelerate towards those waves and it's going to accelerate this way and actually through them. 
and that's exactly what happens so you see the water skier accelerate through the waves and that's actually a great accelerator of the club head and one of the reasons why Matt creates so much speed. Now interestingly as the club head is accelerating in this direction and the hands are going uh, or forcing in this direction it creates a little bit of a tug of war so hands are going this way and away club heads going that way and what happens is those tug of war of forces kind of neutralize each other and so what you see is Matt's hands don't actually move out a lot they actually move more down and if I trace it if I trace this hand path here with a few dots you can see there is a slight outward movement to it but it is a, a much steeper hand path and where the club shaft is so again this is good for amateurs to see that not all body movements or parts of the swing are on the same plane we talk about the one plane swing well look at matt's hand movements there and look at it in relation to the club shaft and the club head movement they're very different and that can actually create more speed so we, these out of plane motions can create more speed and create some better geometry through impact as well now another really interesting thing here is because of that tug of war of forces that I talked about, the club's kind of forcing this way, the hands are forcing this way, that actually bows the lead wrist or it adds flexion to the lead wrist. So if I wind on a few more frames, you can see uh, it's actually a very similar look to Dustin Johnson. So that lead wrist is beyond flat. It's uh, it's gone past flat and it's it's actually bowing here and again i don't think that would be a conscious attempt from matt i think that's more a result of the forces happening during that transition creating that for some players it is good to do that consciously but um for matt i wouldn't have thought that would be a good thing or uh, something that he does now again from this position here Matt looks like almost every other guy on tour. Perhaps that shaft is a little flatter than most. You might see a little bit higher than the the lead or the trail forearm there by most players, but it's a pretty good um, position, or well, it's an excellent position, uh, especially with a driver when you want to be swinging a little bit shallower and perhaps hitting up on the ball. And again, in terms of matchups, this flexion of the lead wrist there that actually squares the club face up earlier. Uh, and is a great match for uh, for his weak grip because most players with a weak grip would hit it way off to the right, hit blocks and slices. Um, but for Matt, if he bows that lead wrist like that, and that's created by the transition or the forces in transition, then that bowed lead wrist plus the weak grip they kind of neutralize each other and it's a good matchup because it, cr it not only creates the face square in but it actually adds some shaft lean and adds the ability to create more power through impact because he can now unleash those angles those wrist angles um, to add a little bit more speed at the bottom and normally from this position here that club for most golfers would swing way out to the right it would be a really in to out swing path but what Matt does well and I know him and his instructor Gigi work on this he rotates the body open his chest especially so that chest works open and you can actually see how much to the left the hands works if I draw a wall here representing where the back of uh, Matt Wolf's lead hand is by the time he gets to impact look how much farther left those hands have worked they've been pulled off that wall and again that's a great matchup a very shallow club shaft with a hand path that's working to the left is great for speed creation it's actually another water skier effect so this is another way that Matt creates a lot of whip at the bottom or that water skiers whip and creates some extra oomph at the bottom. And I actually show, I've written blog posts on parametric acceleration. I even have a module on this in Next Level Golf showing you how this action cr can create that effortless whip that a lot of the pros exhibit. Now from face on, we've talked about how Matt squatted into this position and that leg separation that you see here, so the, the knees are quite far apart. That's not something I like to teach. 
Um, I, I don't like to tell players to get their legs apart like that, but it usually is a result from that pressing into the weighing scale effect. So by pressing into the ground in transition, the legs will usually do that clearing action or the separating action. And again, that's another example of where I'd like to focus more on the the kinetics or the forces involved rather than the, the movement itself. And it's another example of how I use external focuses. So instead of saying separate your knees or create ground pressure, I'd actually tell someone try and make the needle jump on the weighing scale. So that's an external focus, which kind of fits in with most of the motor learning uh, science. So from this squatted position, Matt's in a very powerful position. He can actually use the ground now, and this is the next part of his move, where he actually springs up. It's, it's pretty much a jump. I mean, you can actually see that lead foot there comes off the ground and twists. And that's actually quite a safe move for the leg. A, a lot of players say, oh, isn't the snapping of the left leg gonna cause damage to the knee? Well, no, because during that twisting motion and the straightening of the knee, the lead foot is actually off the ground, so there's, not, there's no torque going on in the knee. If he did that with his foot on the ground, and this is again where um, a lot of previous golf instruction I think has gone wrong by trying to force that lead foot on the ground, and there are certain times where that might be valuable, but if you were to do that with Matt, he probably would break his leg. So it's great that he's instinctively found to let that foot float is, is fine for him. And the reason why the foot floats is because at this point in the swing, we've talked about pressing on the ground and making the needle jump. Well, this is probably around about the point where that pressure into the ground peaks. And so Matt is pushing up in this direction really, really hard. And lots of players, lots of top players, long drivers can actually push up with over 150% of their body weight. So if they, if they weigh 200 pounds, they can be pushing up with 300 pounds of force and that creates a jump. And why do they do this? Why do they push into the ground? Well, that push creates ground forces that allow us to rotate our body harder create more speed because it allows, this is a really important point here, it allows that lead shoulder, and I'm gonna track it from here, I'm gonna put a dot on the lead shoulder in yellow, and I'm gonna put one just post impact. Look how much that lead shoulder has worked up. That lead shoulder's gone up from there to there in that short period of time from kind of hands parallel with the right thigh to hands parallel with the uh, left thigh there. And most golfers, they don't see that amount of movement with the lead shoulder. And why is that movement good? Well, it allows the hand path to work up. So if I draw a dot on the back of his glove there, this is in yellow, so it's a little bit difficult to see, but look at how the back of that left glove works up through impact. Is working up away from the golf ball. Again, another interesting point. I've written about this several times. I've talked about it. I even have a module on this in the strike plan where I talk about the benefits of that. But really, it, it helps with arc height control. Um, so it helps with the quality of striking. And there are lots of other benefits. When we are forcing the hands in this direction, um, just like the boat being forced up in this direction, it creates that wave here, which causes the water skier to accelerate towards it. So that's the last crack of the whip that Matt gets there at the bottom of the swing. So to summarize that Matt Wolf swing analysis, I'll give you a few take homes. There are several power creators that Matt uses. So the water skier effects, both at the top of the swing during transition, and at the bottom with the hands working up, the lead shoulder working up, the body extending up, that creates a force on the club that creates what we call parametric acceleration that can speed up the, uh, the club head at the bottom of the swing. So both of those water skier effects, they accelerate the club head dramatically. The lead wrist flexion extension motions from Matt, so I've put SSC there, which represents 
uh, stretch shortening cycle. And so it's the timing of that flexion and extension. He does it later in transition and then extends or extends the wrist later through impact. And so that really adds a lot of power because there's a, a stretch in the muscles and the wrist and forearms that due to the timing of, of that, it, it creates a lot more power. Do that too early or too late and you lose the power. Matt times that really, really well because of his great transition. And the squat and thrust move as well. They create lots of ground pressure, which is the GP there. And that allows him to push up, push that lead shoulder up and create a lot of force on the handle, which allows him to accelerate the club and does some other great things as well. It's good to look at the differences between backswing and downswing to remind amateur golfers that, and even some professionals that things don't have to be completely symmetrical to be functional. In, in fact, having some asymmetry to the swing can actually improve certain things because you can create these water skier effects and get more speed out of it. There are also some other advantages of creating some asymmetry in the swing, which is why lots of players, lots of really good players have had asymmetrical swings. And Jim Furyk is a, another great example of that. What's more important is that we get correct matchups in the swing or good matchups in the swing. So there are certain things that are going to make you hit more of a heel shot and certain things that are going to make you hit more of a toe shot in your movements. And so balancing those things is going to create a good golf swing. Likewise, there are certain things that are going to get the club to swing to the right through impact and certain things in your movement that will get the club to swing to the left. Balancing those is vital. So some examples that Matt uses, a weak grip, which would tend to hit the ball more to the right, and lots of wrist flexion, which would tend to close or square the face earlier. Those are good matchups. A shallow shaft and a squat, they can help get the club in a good position to deliver from the inside. And that combined with lots of rotation, lots of body opening, especially the upper body through impact, that pulls the hands back into the left and so we've got the, the shallowing of the shaft, which swings to the right, the rotation of the body, which gets the club to swing to the left. Those two neutralize each other in a good way that creates a lot of power, a lot of whip. And the squat and thrust is a great matchup as well. So if Matt just squatted and did nothing else, he would probably take a divot the size of Texas. But the fact that he thrusts up and extends his body up, works that lead shoulder up, that they, they balance each other in terms of arc depth, but they actually create more consistency with, see with the arc depth and they create more speed and a few other great things as well, like increasing the ground pressure, allowing him to rotate his body better, which fits in with all the other matchups there. Now, guys, I know everybody's going to rush out onto the range and try and copy Matt Swing. Don't. It's probably not going to go well. Um, the goal of this is to help you understand a little bit more about mechanics and understand that there are many functional methods to get to impact. Because really, impact is the problem that we're trying to solve as golfers and golf instructors. Impact, this little space where the club is connected to the golf ball, is the most important part of the swing. And getting that repeatable and getting it functional, more importantly, is, is the ultimate goal there. And there are many ways to do that. As I showed you, Nancy Lopez, Ray Floyd, Calvin Pete, they all swing very different ways. Just to reiterate, it's more about matchups, how these moves balance each other out. And so the goal for a golfer, or really my process with golfers, is to identify their impact goals. We all have impact goals, whether you're a tour pro or a complete beginner. Are we trying to speed the club up? Are we trying to improve face strike? Are we trying to improve ground contact? Are we trying to improve face direction or path? There are actually only seven impact goals. And out of those seven, only three or four are, are, are really relevant to many golfers. So once we've got our impact goal, we're trying to look at options available to us. And there are many. There, there are loads of different ways of getting that club to swing more into out. There are loads of different ways of improving face contact. So from those different ways, we have to select the best. And that's where a good pro comes in, in handy or a good teacher or even many of my programs explain to you how to understand and how to implement the right matchups for yourself. And lastly, we need to train effectively to take those new mechanics to the course and to learn them quicker. 
Guys, if you enjoyed this analysis, I have lots of information online. I've got programs, I've got my strike plan, I've got my accuracy plan, depending on what goal you have. And if you really like this analysis and you're after in-depth stuff like this that goes into more than just mechanics, we go into motor learning, psychology, strategy, technique, everything you can imagine. And that's in my next level golf program. So visit www.adamyounggolf.com and check out those programs. You can also get lots of free stuff on my website. I have the occasional video, but I have lots of blogs. I'm known best for my blogging. Uh, writing is my strength, so check out all my articles. And, and hopefully this video has helped improve your golf philosophy and has added something to you.